Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. It's really an honor to have so many of you come out, you know, but I know this is also a subject that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. What we have here tonight is six men of honor, six men with the integrity to come out here and actually argue in a public arena for what they believe or what they do not believe. Now, uh, we're going to hear a lot of interesting things from both sides tonight. We're going to give everyone their opportunity to speak, and we've got a format here that I'll tell you about as to how this debate is going to go. First, for the Christians, Sai Ten Brukenkate is a member of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, and by God's grace alone, he is a Christian. Pastor Jeff Durbin is the pastor of Apologia Church in Tempe, Arizona. And he was also Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat movies. Yes. <laughs> the tour. The tour. <laughs> also, Pastor Paul Vigiano has been the pastor of Branch of Hope Presbyterian Church. That's the church that you're in right now. In Torrance, California for 25 years. Now, for our atheist friends, Bruce Gleason is the founder of the Backyard Skeptics with over 1,400 members. He's the director of the Free Thought Alliance and supports the philosophy that one who lives a naturalistic and materialistic worldview uh, and has no supernatural beliefs will make better decisions about his or her life. He believes that people of faith unknowingly cause harm. Sean Taylor in the middle. Sean is an active member of the secular humanist, skeptic, and atheist communities in Southern California. He has since devoted much time into scholarly research on modern religions, the Bible, the Quran, and the philosophies and history surrounding them. Our third speaker on the end is Andrew Breeding, who recently graduated from Cal State Fullerton with a degree in philosophy specializing in ethics. His interests are computers, politics, and sushi. <laughs> Now, as for the format, you recognize that it's a bit unusual, and the reason for that is we don't have just one speaker speaking to one speaker. There really is a call in today's society to have the conversation openly, airing grievances and doing analysis. So we have three speakers for each side. Each speaker will get the opportunity to speak. The first speaker will speak an opening statement of 20 minutes, and the other side, all three of them, will have the opportunity to cross-examine. At the same time, if that speaker chooses to defer a question, he may ask either of his other partners to answer that question for him. Then the next speaker from the other side will have 20 minutes in the same format. Then the next speaker for side A will have a 15-minute rebuttal, uninterrupted, followed by a five-minute cross-examination by the other side. And then the other side will have the same opportunity. After that, there will be a 10-minute closing argument by each side, uninterrupted, giving a synopsis and their analysis of the content of the debate. After that, we will open up the floor for your comments and questions. Now, at this time, we would usually pray, but we don't want to give an unfair advantage to either side. <laughs> So at this time, we will uh, have our honored guest, Bruce Gleason, begin his direct arguments. Thanks for coming. I understand this is a conference over the weekend. Is this like uh, your entertainment instead of a big dance? I understand. I'd rather have a big party myself. Let's, let's just forget this and have a big party. No, okay, can't do that. Okay. Well, I'd like to take the temperature of the room here. How many Christians are here tonight? Raise your hands. How many atheists? Thank you for coming. Okay. How many young earth creationists are here? Christians that believe in a 6,000-year-old. How many Christians here believe in an old earth? 4.5 million billion years old. Okay, just wanted to see where we're at right there. Before we go on, I need to explain what an atheist is. There's a lot of misconceptions of atheists. No, we're not baby eaters. That's from the South from years ago, forget it. Um, an atheist assumes that there's no God, asserts that there's no God or gods. That's pretty much it. There's no agenda, no mantra, no dogma, no text. It's a secular humanist philosophy. 
Are there variations? Yes, there are variations. I happen to be in what's called an anti-theist. I promote atheism because I think it's a better worldview to live by. There's also strong atheists that say there is no God. There are soft atheists or weak atheists that say, I don't believe in a God, there might be a God. That's not agnosticism, that is atheism. There are two different things going on here. But I'm an atheist because I don't reject the Bible. It's because I read it. I have examined all the apologist arguments over the past 10 years and have not found one void of fallacy. I have gone on a quest to find the truth, and through the Socratic method of questioning, I have found it. And the truth for me is that the supernatural does not exist. Are we up there? Good. I'll take the first shot across the bow. Thank you, Sean, my loyal assistant. Sai will probably say that he knows that I really do believe in a God. That means he knows what's going on inside my head. And all of your heads as well. Not only that, it's extremely presumptuous and silly, but downright arrogant, I think. No one knows what's going on inside my head or anyone else here. When I say I don't believe in a God, he has no justification to tell me otherwise. Presuppositionalists start with the Bible and their own definition of God that conflicts with many other Christian sects out there and does not question. He will not give any evidence besides personal revelation and the Bible tonight. If he does, after the 25 debates that I've seen on YouTube, it'll be the first. Scientific skeptics like myself and atheists have a habit of doing just that, questioning, questioning everything and gladly admitting we don't know anything to be 100% true. We base our opinions on the probability that something is true based on evidence. It appears that Jeff and Sy are downright wrong because just because naturalistic philosophy does not obtain an absolute knowledge, it does not mean God did it. That's a false dichotomy, one of the many fallacies you might hear tonight. I hope you're up on your fallacies. Red herrings, special pleading. Pre-subs build a bridge to an island. They cross the bridge and then they burn the bridge. If they were 100% wrong, they wouldn't even know it. They are totally on the offensive and offer no defense whatsoever that withstands fallacies on top of fallacy. They try to turn difficult, philosophical, unresolved issues into insolvable, unresolvable issues. And listen for that tonight. This is not how philosophy works. Surprisingly, my opponents are actually going to argue against themselves tonight because any religion with any holy text can say the exactly the same thing that they are saying. I claim that logic and reason came from a natural evolutionistic uh, pr um, progress, but the difference is I have strong evidence from anthropology and, evidence and evolutionary psychology, and presuppositionalists have empty claims with zero evidence. So let's take a look at God's existence. Okay, here we go, we're on time. A good starting point is to examine if God, believe, uh, God exists, is to start with the assumption of the null hypothesis. What is that? Not believing in God's existence. The reason we have to do this is because if we believe in a God told to us that existed, it would take more than a human's lifetime to examine all the different gods. If a Muslim was up here right now, you would probably think he was delusional. If a Hindu was up here, you probably thought he was mistaken. But an atheist differs from any believer in that we reject the belief in all gods. If I told you I believed in a god that you haven't heard about from this position, you would have to start at the null hypothesis because you wouldn't know anything about the god. Let's take a look at personal revelation, and this is a big one. Since the method of choice of how presuppositionalists pre gain knowledge, we are all humans, Humans can be mistaken, therefore everyone on earth can be mistaken. This logical statement can be said by most everyone except for those strong in their supernatural beliefs so much that they do not know that they can be mistaken. If you are one of these people in this debate tonight, you might think about the possibility that you might be misled or possible, possibly you have not examined the opposite opinion. And that's one of my best sayings tonight, my axiom. The best way to know what is true is to study the best argument against your opinion. The best way to know what is true. That's it. That's what we do as skeptics. It's my guess that my, opposite, my opponents will say they cannot be delusional because they believe in a revelation from God just like every other person on earth that believes in a different God. This is a vacuous claim. 
Suppose you're a presuppositionalist and God gave you a revelation that you would call absolute knowledge, very much like they do, then, and you were certain it was true, then later you changed your mind because you found convincing evidence that this knowledge was untrue. Does this mean that God was wrong? More likely, it would be that they were misled, either by a malicious God or simply their own belief. If you believe that you misinterpreted God's word, what's to say you can't do it again? Can pre-subs receive knowledge about other things, like a medical, a medical degree, eight years of education, pray and it'll be done? What type of knowledge is Sai and Jeff actually looking at? It's not called knowledge, it's just strong belief. Suppose that one person received revelation from a God and says it's knowledge, and the other person, or for a matter, 300 people, receive personal revelation that conflicts with that one person. Whose God's is it, uh, revelation is truly God's word? No one can tell. I think personal revelation is a very dangerous thing. You can do very bad things while thinking you will have immunity from any punishment because you're doing God's work. Here are some examples. Virginia Tech, 2007. His mother knew that he had psychological problems, and what did she do instead of go to a psychiatrist? She went to a minister and prayed. 32 children, kids, students are killed because she didn't have the right personal revelation. Andrea Yates, 2001, killed her four children because God told her to kill them, prevent, to prevent them from going to hell. Jim Jones, 1978, 300 people died because of his personal revelation. And finally, just last week, a 19-year-old was killed by his own pastor father. They beat him to death. Took two hours. His 17-year-old lived, and he was beaten almost to death. Do two sides of war pray to each god? How about football games, Mr. Tebow? Okay, I'll pass that one up. Horrible things can happen when using this type of reasoning. Let's go to the attributes of God, because that's really what this debate is about. The Christian's description of a God is one with no physical attributes. He has no matter, no energy. Yet his mind, he has a mind and can move things like planets, stars, mountains, and give men special revelations. But he has no matter energy. How does he actually do the work? How can there be a mind in total vacuous space? If God has special powers at work, wouldn't we see that in the universe with our most sensitive telescopes? But we don't see anything supernatural over of a 30, the 12 billion, excuse me, 13.5 billion years we've been around. We don't see any stars going faster than the speed of light. We don't see anything that breaks the laws of physics. And shouldn't the power be so great and God should be so easily seen because he's so powerful? We don't see God's power with our most sensitive scientific earth-based instruments that can discover the majesty of some atomic particles and even see into our brains. God works in mysterious ways, they might say, but it's unreasonable to explain a mystery with another mystery. If God exists and is omniscient, he knows everything from the beginning of time. If he knew everything that was going to happen as told in the Bible, why does he seem so upset? Why does he seem so angry? God cannot be omniscient and omnipotent at the same time. This is going into a little bit of philosophy, but if God is unchanging, immutable, perfectly made the universe, it's a hands-off God. He can't have the power to change anything because that would be admitting he was wrong. He's immutable. He's non-changing. He set everything up. Did God create us humans knowing ahead of time that most of us would end up in hell? What, would a loving God really kill nearly everyone on earth? and call it love. Even Sai has previously agreed in other debates that this is not the loving God that most Christians believe in. What this sounds like is a story that is made up to instill fear in people, made up so people will obey men's laws that are attributed to a so-called God. Would a just God offer a total ignorant man and woman the chance and we are stuck? Can I have a timeout, Christopher? We are stuck. Christopher and uh, the AV guy. I'm praying really hard. It's not working. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll take a one-minute break. How many people are going to have questions afterward? Oh, come on, two? I have to be more interesting than that.
We were stuck on the hell thing now. Would I make a good preacher if I was a, a believer? I don't know. I'm pretty passionate. Oh, he agrees. I think I would be. Uh, do we have any bouncers here tonight? <laughs> We're still working. This is a new system, by the way. I'm not Mr. blaming Gleason, anybody here. Mr. if you here. want time out, you have to be, remain silent. I'm sorry. What was I? If you want time out, you must remain silent. I was just trying to be entertaining. That's right. That wasn't in the rule book. I'm just kidding you, Chris. <laughs> just kidding you. If God knew Adam and Eve were going to eat the fruit, then it's not Adam and Eve's fault for eating it. They had no other choice to obey God's plan. Should we really blame them for original sin, even if God knew it? And I know what you're going to say, they had a choice. No, they didn't have a choice. If you think God is omniscient and there is no free will, and there is no way around this problem, God's, God knows the next thought in our heads before we even think it. We do not have a choice if God is omniscient. It's a very difficult problem for um, Christians to overcome. God knew it all along. Most of us know that it's impossible to obey everything in the Bible, obey everything in the Bible in modern society. But I got a solution. What if God changed the Bible? Every Bible in the entire world, all at once, God could punch, expunge outdated verses and put in new ones. He could possibly make a different color for every hundred years. Now that would be a supernatural act I could respect. If there was a perfect Christian God with perfect communication, why would he have 44,000 sects all believing different things? Is this the right design that a God would have if he was perfect? Why would God put the writing of his words in the hand of such fallible species as humans anyway? God could just create the Bible from nothing, poof, and have it magically appear in every country in the world and all the languages all at once. That would be awesome, but it didn't happen. When Christians pray and their prayers are heard by God, wouldn't God heal them in such a way that the evidence of Christians being healed more than other believers would be greater by percentage than any other religion? Yes, he would, but that doesn't happen. But we should see that happening in the Christian world because you pray that you're going to get well and it's just by chance that you get well. There have been dozens of prayer studies, many by Christian organizations, that result in no correlation between prayers and healing. Everyone on earth presented with the same medical condition and the same medical care lie, uh, li uh, lives and dies equally. That's a fact. There's no way around it. Lastly, if God is all-powerful, could he do something that he, his nature might not want him to do? If you call it nature, he's all-powerful. He could do anything. Could he commit suicide? Could he divide himself up into different gods? But there's no way to tell. Uh oh, I lost it. There's no way to tell exactly what his nature is based on the thousands of different Christian sects that believe in different interpretations. Maybe God could move to an adjoining universe and leave us all together, but if he did, how would we know? How would we know? Would we like. All the believers will say, I don't feel it anymore. No, probably they'd keep on believing. If the Christian God did exist and Christianity was the only true religion, hospitals would have a heyday on this. Oh, you're a Christian scientist. You're going to get healed 30% more than anybody else because Christian scientists, I guess, are the true religion or any other, pick any other sect. Christians would never have to leave their faith. Out of the 1,400 members that I have, half are believers, were believers. They were Bible studiers. They just didn't leave because they hated God. They didn't hate God. No biblical scholars were turned into atheists. There's dozens or hundreds of biblical scholars written lots of books, Bart Ehrman, uh, John Loftus, a lot of people that have, have, uh, read, have read the Bible and turned into atheists. The answers to the hardest questions would be so strong that there would be no question that Christianity was true. There would be no fallacies, no logical contradictions. Everything would be easily explained, and they would be, there would be very little to criticize. But that's not the case. Christianity, if true, 
would be so strong that an eighth grader could easily defend it against the smartest non-believer, and that's just not the case. If any religion was so true that all unabashed, educated atheists were joining that religion, I would seriously have to take a look, but that is not the case. In fact, atheism is growing. Now up to 20% of the U.S., 33% of kids, uh, people under 30. All the churches, half of the churches in Northern Europe are now nightclubs, bars, and restaurants. People are leaving the church. Why? Because of the internet expands knowledge. Religion, especially Christianity, can be extremely confusing on what sect is true. All of them have different demands on the Christian and different ways to get to heaven, faith, good, good works, whatever. They have all different doctrines and believe in things that other sects would consider only an apostate would do, speaking in tongues, not dancing, whatever. What would make Christianity the coolest religion? The coolest religion. Gods could send a prophet ever so often down to earth when Christians would be misinterpreting some of their text and would change the Bible verses so it would reflect more of the modern moral moralities. Eliminate slavery, for example, in the Bible. Or God himself could rearrange the text in all the Bibles, all at once. I think that's a double. I think I said that before. Would it be perfectly just God? Would a perfectly just God tell his parents to kill their son if he is insubordinate? No, of course not. Would this God kill 50,000 people in a nearby village just because a small group of Israelites who were returning the ark to the covenant to its rightful place who looked at the ark? 50,000 people, innocent, in a nearby village, gone. Two totally minutes. innocent. No, a righteous God would not do that. Why did the scholars who were deciding on which books to be included in the Bible not include the books that were supposedly inspired by God as well? Why would a particular God want to destroy the world again during the apocalypse and comment, condemn good people all around the world, even those who have never heard of Christianity, that have good moral lives? By believing in an all-powerful deity paralyzes one thinking and cripples the choices you have to, make, uh, to escape a false reality that is self-centered and apocalyptic. Looking at the truth requires courage and intellectual honesty of finding the best argument against your own. This is the holy grail of skepticism. If you're not willing to examine the arguments, then you have to admit that you're not willing to find the truth. No one can ignore billions of other people believing differently and justify that your God is the only one. If you question that, if you question what you believe, and more importantly, why you believe it, you just might extricate yourself from the supernatural world of belief and discover the wonder of naturalistic world without ghosts, demons, devils, magical thinking, or malicious God, gods. Live well in this world. It's the only one we know for sure that exists. At this Thank time, you. the other side will have 10 minutes to cross-examine.